All right, let's go again. Let's try it again. Okay, good evening, everybody in London. Thank you for joining us on this special occasion. This is really a celebration of many things for Michael. First of all, the publication of his beautiful new book, extraordinary book with a beautiful slip case. And thank you, Michael, for signing so many copies for us. Very great pleasure. Mm -hmm. Photographs and stories. The second celebration is that you've just turned 70 years old and you don't look older than 20. Oh, but I feel it. Yes. You have really good complexion and skin care. <laughs> and the most phenomenal thing to me is that we're celebrating 50 years, Michael, 50 years of your professional life as a photographer, which is an extraordinary feat. Many great artists seem to decline in their later years, but somehow you found the secret of eternal youth and eternal energy and eternal passion. Where does this come from, Michael? Well, as the, as the immortal Bob, Bob Dylan says, I'm so glad I've never had to work a day in my life because I have this passionate hobby that I can continue with forever. Uh, it never feels like I'm working. Every day I come to my office, which is usually the landscape or some mountain or some beauteous, beauteous region around the world. I'm often in Northern uh, Hokkaido. And yes, one could say, yes, you know, he's, he's working, but it, it never feels like you're working. So in, in a sense, it's, it, is the, it is the key to, to eternal youth, I think, not to work. Well, whenever I talk to a creative person, I'm going to get serious here for a second, apart from this banter. Um, I'm reminded of these words by a man called Viktor Frankl in an extraordinary book, Man's Search for Meaning. And he said the following, don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you're going to miss it. For success, like happiness, cannot be pursued, it must ensue. And it is only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself. What do you think your cause has been all these well, years? Obviously a much smarter person than, than I certainly, but uh, my cause has been to enjoy life to its highest potential, I think. Um, to live to whatever I can do. Um, I was just listening to something on the radio yesterday where they were saying, the more you pursue life for others, the more happiness, satisfaction, creative license that one receives oneself. So I'm regarded as a photographer in the, in the general world, but I really regard myself as, as, a, as a postman. I go around the world, I pick up packages from all these wonderful places. Um, I don't create them, I pick them up, I bring them home, I deliver them. Unfortunately, I have you as, as one, of the, one of my great cohorts who can also help in, in that uh, manifestation. When did this calling, if we can call it this, first begin? I think about 10 minutes ago, I'm working on it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, you were called, you were called to the Zoom. It's, 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 work. It, as you say, in terms of setting goals, I never really set a goal. You know, I, I came from a very humble uh, background in Northern England, uh, working class, quite poor Irish Catholic family. Uh, I thought I wanted to become a Catholic priest to begin with, and it made sense at the time. I went to a seminary boarding school. Um, I decided at, probably at puberty that maybe this wasn't such a great idea. Uh, the only thing I seemed to be decent at was, was doodling, scribbling, uh, drawing. And so I went to art school. From art school, I went to photography school just because it seemed a natural <clears throat> progression to choose an occupation where I could make a living because I needed to, as well as exercise my own self-expression, which I also needed to. Uh, I spent three years in London studying photography, and then I started moving around the world. I went to the States as an exchange student. I came back. I worked in commercial work. I studied the work of other photographers. Um, I could have happily been a, a musician, a, a dancer, a, a poet, or a painter. A, you know, any profession that I happened to have landed into would have been perfect. I happened to land in photography. 
And it's been an absolutely wonderful profession for 50 years. I mean, I cannot believe that I've managed to survive all these years doing something that I absolutely love to do every second. I love every step of this, you know, old Luddite analog process that I still use, you know, all the way from, you know, loading the film, wandering off to locations, photographing, having no idea what's going to come out on the film, finding the film, processing it, doing the contact sheets, deciding on images, printing them in the darkroom, spending hours and hours um, having exhibitions, making books and dealing with, you know, sweet people like yourself. It's been a, a great time. Who were your main influences in your early career? Well, in my early career, I studied the work of master photographers such as Bill Brandt, uh, Eugene Agier, Joseph Sudek, Mario Giacomelli, uh, Stieglitz. You know, these are all romantic masters of photography. <clears throat> I was very, very fortunate to uh, meet Ruth Bernhard when I was in San Francisco, very, very poor undernourished at the time, sleeping and living hand to mouth, basically. Uh, I worked for Ruth Bernhard for between eight and 10 years on and off, uh, printing her she was, work. <clears throat> she was extraordinary. I mean, uh, I, see, I see probably her greatest photo behind you in your office here. <clears throat> yes, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Perspect <laughs> perspective two. <laughs> perspective two is on the wall, yes. Yeah, very yeah. Ruth was a bundle of energy. So I'm sure you absorbed a lot of that from her. I did. I did. and I met wonderful people was, like yourself through Ruth Bernhard. But she well, also she was, you know, she was feisty. She was an incredible, energizing spirit. Yes. Um, yes. What did she actually teach you that you didn't know <laughs> before well, you started to print for her? What, what was the big me. epiphany? She taught me how to make coffee with a little salt in it, black yeah. coffee. It was very, that was her thing, which kept me working from, you know, seven o'clock in the evening until one o'clock in the morning every, every time. She would put haagen uh, ice cream in it too, so to make it extra special. Um, essentially, to begin with, she taught me how to print. <clears throat> so I thought I was a really good printer. I loved printing. I printed for other professional photographers when I left the London College of Printing. And uh, of course, I was, you know, I was exposed to, you know, prints like Ansel Adams and Brett Weston and the California School, which are very, very beautiful and masterful, all contain all the zones. And Ruth turned everything upside down. She essentially said, well, you know, as Ansel said, this is the raw material and we're going to do all sorts of things with this. The first time in the darkroom with her, she decided to print black lines around the frame. She would elongate the easel. She would use stocking material to make them slightly soft. She would use different chemicals. I mean, just that uh, of innovation, creativity, spontaneity at each time. And no matter how good the print was, <laughs> she was never, ever satisfied. And yeah. it's guaranteed that if we had to print it again next week, she would completely change her mind, and, which is which was a revelation for me because I always thought, you know, here's the negative. This is the way you make a good print. And this is a good print. And then and you when can you, make more when good you started, print. When you started to show her your own work, what was her input for you? Oh, she was absolutely wonderful. Ruth was, Ruth would see anybody and everybody who came through the door and they would, she would look at their work. She would be highly encouraging. No matter, even if she didn't like, 99 of the photographs, she could pick out one to say something nice about. And that was one of her great qualities. She didn't say bad things about photography. She mm -hmm. said good things about it. She would always choose the, the kind of the innate uh, essence of whichever a photographer came in the door and, and, and focus on that. <clears throat> so for my work, she was encouraging from the start. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have many arguments and debates because her big thing was that creativity is beauty is all around us that we shouldn't need to go more than 10 feet from our bed to find absolutely gorgeous material to photograph and i of course would get on planes and travel for three thousand miles to, to photograph we did things slightly differently but you know she understood and i understood her and we got along very very well and where did your wanderlust come from? Is it growing up in, in, in a poor town in England? Do you <laughs> sense that there was a whole other great world out of there? I've got to break out and see <laughs> it. I don't know. I think 
no idea where it came from. I just I've always wanted to travel and loved traveling. And from the first time I, you know, I, I, I left home when I was 10 and a half, essentially, to go to boarding school. And uh, in many ways, never looked back. I loved my home. I loved my family. But I also loved being away. I loved being on my own. I mean, we have to imagine, it, it, it sounds a bit Dickensian almost, but you, uh, I, my bedroom I shared with my four brothers. It was a very small, small room, no central heating you know, at all, you know, frost on the windows, all this sort of stuff. Uh, I always shared a bed. And I went to boarding school when I was 10 and a half, and, and I had my own bed for the very first time in my life, and I loved it. I had a little curtain I could close my cubicle. I had my own space. And from that point onwards, kind of getting away, moving to different places, exploring the landscape, exploring cultures, meeting new people. It was all just absolutely fascinating, something that I you know, wanted to do and, and in a sense had to do. I, I didn't really have a choice. It was just it was burning inside me. I always wanted to go somewhere else and explore. So you had endless curiosity, which is an important asset for a photographer, don't you think? I think so. Yes, yes. I think I think uh, you know. Often people say, "Well, why do you still use analog?" And one of the reasons I always say is that is because I can't control it. I can't predict it. I never quite know what's coming out, and I love that. I love the fact that that I can always be have this doubt. You know, this is the Paul Tillich thing. You know, doubt is central to faith. Not actually knowing is a perfect kind of incentive push drive to creativity that you're always trying something else trying somewhere new trying something new can we look at our, the first image please could you put that up for us uh, yes. i think Martin. this is one of you, one of your all-time great photographs for for me um just it's so poetic, Michael. It's delicate and it's poetic and it's just pure beauty. So you just were strolling down this beautiful road and you saw this. How did it come about? It, no, it doesn't quite happen like that, although occasionally it does. Uh, Andre Lenotre was one of the photographers. Uh, no, it was one of the landscape architects that I really admired. <clears throat> and Eugene Ajay photographed his gardens in and around Paris uh, throughout his life. And much of my early career was spent, in a sense, learning and chasing other photographers to see how they looked, what they photographed, where they photographed, how they photographed. And I went in search of Eugene Age around Paris. Uh, so this is in Marly, uh, one of the gardens designed by André Lenotre. And I would photograph a place like this for days or even weeks. Uh, so this was just one morning when I would be in this place. Um, looking at it now, of course, it has, you know, what I often love to have in photographs, which is this pathway that goes to nowhere, which for me is very symbolic of life, generally, <laughs> that we don't quite know where the end is, when the end is, and what is behind that mist. We have no idea. I mean, we all have our different beliefs and religions and philosophies, but I certainly, as the older I get, the more I become ignorant. Um, and I just absolutely adore this creeping vine that just crept out of this wonderfully manicured, controlled, uh, deliberated landscape. Andre Lenotre, I did my uh, senior thesis in, in Perspective Illusions, and, and uh, Andre Lenotre was, was, was a fan of illusions. He, he would lead you down paths, and then you hit this water, and you have to walk miles around the water. He was always very curious about his placings. And so to have this creeping wild vine that I always had this, 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 this great admiration for those who don't conform, for those who are not necessarily people, but anything that is slightly different, slightly odd, idiosyncratic. And, and, and this creeping vine had that feeling for me. But the power for me in this image is, is maybe just the fragility of nature. And that's a, that's a theme throughout much of your work. You have great respect for nature. You 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 are you're pushing us to, res to for us to respect it even more, aren't you? Is that your mission? Part of your mission? Part of your cause? Well, we are one and part of nature. You know, we are one living organism. This whole universe, and 
I always feel connected to whatever I photograph. And again, this is a this is a Ruth Bernhard philosophy uh, deeply embedded when I spent time with her, uh, that one should respect whatever what one is photographing. So I make it a, a mission to, to ask permission, whatever I photograph, whether it's nuclear power station, Nazi concentration camps, or, or beautiful, beautiful gardens. And uh, I think we're all aware and conscious of how fragile and beautiful nature is and how we as humans are in a position of responsibility to take care of it because we are currently destroying it as we all know and um <clears throat> yeah can, can we see the next image please mm -hmm. tell me about tory gate tell me what these gates are and how you were attracted to them i first went to japan in 1987 and uh, immediately was struck with these usually uh, vermilion red Tory gates, which are scattered around the Japanese landscape. They uh, denote or they symbolize uh, the Shinto philosophy that deities reside in the landscape, in the water, in the earth, in the forests. Um, I mentioned earlier that I, I studied to be a priest. I have a great veneration for what I don't know. Um, part of the part of Catholicism is that there is a a light on the altar that denotes a presence of a God that we can't hear, see, touch, feel. But you know, some people have faith that that God is there. Um, in the Jew in the um, Japanese philosophy. These Shinto gates uh, denote that God is in everything around us, not just in a church, in a cathedral, in a mosque, synagogue, anything. It is in nature. And I just absolutely love that. It's an, it, it seems to be a, a, almost a call to prayer, a call to calm down, a call, a call to be quiet, slow down, um, meditate, think about things. Um, so whenever I see them, <clears throat> no matter how you know fast or furious the day is going, it immediately lowers my blood pressure, I think, lowers my pulse rate, and I can become very absorbed. So I can spend hours just sitting around watching these things in, in water, as I say, in forests. Um, they're all over the place in Japan. Can we see the next image, please? Here again, tranquility, serenity, peace, hope. Um, photograph yeah, photographing in the in, in the north of uh, of Japan was 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 an eye opener. It really changed my universe. Um, I think all the photographers I mentioned earlier, we can see them as the dark romantics, some somewhat, and almost as if uh, we start with this dark uh, canvas and light emanates out. You know, again, it's even my you know early religious belief. You know, we sit in dark churches and and light emanates out from the altar or from the light on the altar. Being in the north of, of, of Japan, it felt as if we start with a white canvas completely. And then we have kanji characters, uh, sumie ink marks that are, that are placed into this rectangle. Um, it becomes almost two dimensional. It becomes quite uh, minimalistic. Um, the trees are just enough in this photograph for me. It balances the the the, the kind of the, the, that gray patch on the left side. Um, and I often say that we look at a photograph like this. It's very calm, very peaceful, uh, very composed. And <laughs> and I think of of my relative state at the time of, of you know it's like trying to get through you know eight feet high banks of of snow with with soggy cameras and, and freezing hands and everything else um, to, to, to find this beautiful photograph. My, my greatest respect for you, Michael, is that you've resisted over all these years the, the pressures to go big by many galleries who think, well, the bigger the photo, the easier it is to sell. I think you're extraordinary because you just ignore all this noise from the real world, the real art world, 
And the power of these images is because they're so intimate, they're so small, and it just invites you to connect with what you're talking about. Next image, please. Has that been hard for you over the years to ignore all this pressure? Make it big, Michael, make it big and sell it for more money and all the nonsense of the art world? Well, when I, was, when, I was, when I was talking about that uh, creeping vine, about how I, how I love those who kind of go against the grain. Um, I, you know, I, I'm today wearing my you know, Everton sweatshirt and, we'll talk uh, about that later, yes. Uh, no, no, but there's, there is a point because all my family, everybody I knew supported the other team. Yeah, and Liverpool, went, right? Yes. Yeah. I went to Everton precisely because everybody supported the other team. And, and I think part of my voyage in the art world has always been to say, well, what's the mass movement? Yeah. And I don't need to be part of that. <laughs> um, that's why in you stand out strange, because everybody is a... in a strange way. Yes. Yeah. So you know, large color is absolutely wonderful, but it's not for me. I you know I went to California and, and you know I looked at Ansel Adams's massive, beautiful, gorgeous prints of the of the natural landscape, and I went to Yosemite and I tried hard to photograph like him. It wasn't happening. Um, so we all have our strengths and weaknesses, and um, I find this small, intimate. Uh, scale works very, very well for me. It engages people at a at a distance of about 10 or 12 inches. It becomes almost an intimate um, connection. And that is what I'm looking for. That is where I came from. My my town was a small town. I was used to wandering around in, in the park, making you know intimate connections with, with trees and playgrounds and so forth. It's not these huge enormous landscape and these very, very large prints is, is it's great, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's just not me. And well, uh, I, I, I think we should fight against that. I think your photos are holy objects. I mean, I love to just hold them in my hand and just look at them and touch them and just communicate with them. You, you, you know, you are a priest, Michael. You've, you've fulfilled your <laughs> initial vocation. I will you, bless you later, don't worry. <laughs> you've, you've given us something to aspire to and to respect. And that's your genius, Michael. Thank you. Very, very kind. Mm -hmm. Next image, please. This is a particularly important tree for you over your career, hasn't it been? It has, yes. I met this tree in 2002 on the banks of Kasharo Lake in uh, Hokkaido. And uh, I did photograph it at the time. I've, I like to make friends with trees uh, throughout the world. Some I return to many, many times. This one I return to for uh, every year for uh, seven years uh, and, and photographed it. Um, I, you know, it's, unfortunately, then it was, it was cut down because it was on the banks of a lake and people um, historically would climb onto the branches and, in the summer and, and hang out there. Um, I made a little book, Kasharo Lake Tree, and a family in Hokkaido locally very kindly sent me a color photograph of their whole family sitting on the same tree, which is absolutely charming and, and, and wonderful. So it's very, very sad, of course, when, when the tree went, but uh, it, was, it was recorded in the Hokkaido Shinbun, the local newspaper that, you know, Kenna's tree has been cut down. Have so, you found another tree to replace it in your affection? Many, <laughs> many. <laughs> I have. I recently made a, 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 a tree book, and uh, I was asked to look into my archive as to how you know which tree photographs should we make the selection from. And I was absolutely astonished to find that I had over six hundred photographs of trees in my archive, and so there are <laughs> so, some of them with many studies too. But of course, this one was was very, very special, the Kishara Lake tree. Next image, please. Wow. The delicacy of this image is just extraordinary. Tell me, tell me how it came to be. Um, I like to photograph in China when I can. And there was one place in Yunnan, uh, which has these rice fields, which are filled with water in the uh, early spring. <clears throat> And sometimes when the mist comes in, 
uh, it looks like snow. It's very, very beautiful, very graphic. And I made arrangements to be there. Of course, I expected, you know, to be there on my own. I got there and I found these, uh, these, 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 these uh, thousands, literally thousands of, of photographers arrayed in these, in these layers, almost like it was a theater. Wow. Um, and I somehow managed to find a place. I photographed for many, many hours. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, but it was always, you know, photographers everywhere, which is not what I was anticipating. But anyway, we we I photographed and then we left and drove to a tiny village to find some lunch. We pulled into the car park and this was in front of me. And I literally jumped out, took a few snaps and then it changed as it does mist comes and goes. And in some ways, from my whole time in Yunnan, which was a number of days, this is my favorite photograph. It is very, very simple. Uh, it's just two planes, uh, bamboo in front, misty tree behind. Uh, but it has that haiku-esque quality of, of minimal detail and um, a maximum amount of suggestion. Well, I can very, very easily get lost into this photograph. Well, I'm getting lost looking at it now. What, what is the basic difference between shooting in China or Japan? How, how do they differ as locations for you? Or does um, your approach they, differ? They're different, different people. It's, it's, I find in, in Asia generally, it's whichever country you are in, they want to know how it's different from the other Asian countries. And I've never been able to, to be politically um, sophisticated enough to differentiate between those. But China, Chinese people generally are extremely inquisitive and curious. So if I'm photographing by the side of the road, um, buses will stop, cars will stop, people will jump out to see exactly what I'm photographing. And they will look right into the viewfinder. <laughs> they have no qualms whatsoever. Whereas Japanese people keep their distance always. They're very, very <laughs> reserved. Next image, please. Well, we've seen many photos of flowers, but this is, I mean, it's just a, such a technical tour de force, isn't it? To create the balance in this image and the power of it. For, for every one image you would finally sign and approve, how many have you, would you typically maybe reject in your darkroom practice? My darkroom practice, I reject many, many prints, yes. I remember I was taught by, um, actually it was a Ukrainian uh, photographer in London College of Printing who was very, very poor himself. And so he would always tell me not to reject prints, to keep every print. And Ruth Bernhard, she always would keep all her reject prints and give them to people. Um, I found that at a certain point, I, I really had to break with that because I just had mountains and mountains of prints sitting around and some of them were not very good prints. And so uh, many years ago now, I, I started becoming absolutely ruthless. Um, it takes me, you know, three to six hours to, to you know, make some prints of, of a negative, basically. Uh, I spend a long time getting there. I go through many variations, possibilities, cropping, contrast, uh, burning in, dodging. I use multiple filters for uh, one particular print. I usually make a series of prints, maybe 10 or 15, you know, maybe half of them will get ripped up afterwards um, because of dry down and toning effects and, and so forth. Uh, so my success rate is, is still uh, quite low. Uh, having said that, I have now been printing for almost 50 years and, and I should be <laughs> reasonably competent at it, you'd think. Um, but I still find it's a, it's a creative, journey full of uh, pitfalls and, and, and highlights. Um, I often get to the point of thinking this is a really good print. I dry it, I flatten them, and I decide I have to reprint it again. Um, I think one becomes something, um, I don't know if it's perfectionist, but I, I find that you know I, I, I do need to print all my own prints still. I've, I've worked with you know, assistants who have been very, very good, have produced very, very competent prints, but I still find that um, 
I almost need to be part of the process. It's, 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 I find printing is a bit like playing with clay, that you're molding something, you're trying to bring something out. Like Michelangelo says he tries to find the figure inside the block of stone. And I find printing is something like that. It's also a good period of solitude and, and meditation. Now you, can, you can spend hours and hours in the dark room and have no idea what's going on. Uh, printing is very, very important to me, as you can understand. Well, I think that's why we love you, Michael. Your prints are just yeah. so glowing and extraordinary and uplifting. Ne next image, please. Wow. This is what I call a wow image. I'm totally <laughs> seduced into it. You take me into this arena. Tell me how this came about. I had a, a project, uh, something of a commission to photograph in Abruzzo, which is uh, halfway down Italy uh, on the Adriatic side. And uh, I had a guide, Vincenzo Pompei, who would take me to all these wonderful places um, in the mountains and the forests along the ocean. Uh, it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, for, for three years, I photographed. And, and this was actually the very last photograph I made as part of that project. Uh, he did say, you know, in Pacentro, there is this long alley of these stone pines, which I would like to take you to. And he, as he normally did, he took me there, he dropped me off, and, and it was early in the morning, and I began to photograph. Um, the resulting photograph, I have to say, is far more powerful than I envisaged at the time I was photographing. You know, Ansel talks about pre-visualization. Uh, Jerry Olsman talks about constipation when it comes to that sort of thing. Um, I'm somewhere in between. I, I try not to make decisions when I'm photographing as to how I will print them. This one came out very strangely because it's it, it, it became a mystical forest. It almost looks like it's photoshopped in some strange manner. Um, one is led down this corridor of trees. One expects magical things to happen and one one is hopeful that magical things will happen because they'll be very exciting. The canopy of the trees is somehow almost as if it's at night. One can almost see stars up there. So there's a daylight and nighttime enigma uh, that, 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 that's taking place. As I mentioned before, it's, it's, it's often the case in my, in, in, in my work that I like to invite a viewer as well as myself into an image, I leave a lot of space in an image for the viewer to enter and to create their own dialogue with what is happening. So when you commented how you'd kind of like to walk down here, I also, every time I see this print, I think, yes, I could walk down there and something would happen. Whether it's something in my head, some imagination, a story can be created. Would you say this is one of your harder negatives to print? It's impossible to print. <laughs> yes. And a lot of people don't understand that with uh, silver gelatin printing, hand printed, no two prints are ever alike. It, they look alike, but when you compare them, and historically when you compare, you know, Wynne Bullock, Ansel Adams, anybody's from different times of their lives, or Ruth Bernhard, it may be the same negative, but the prints are totally different. And the same for me in this. Sometimes they're much lighter. Sometimes they're very airy. Sometimes they're very, very dark. Sometimes the contrast is more. And, and it, it varies, I think, as to how you're feeling on that particular day, as to the interval of time between the first printing, second printing, third printing, fourth printing, whatever it is. Um, and I've always loved that you don't have to slavishly create an edition of identical prints. That, you know, print number one, print number five can be different. They work there from the same negative. So you don't have a master print that you always refer back to, or do you? I always keep, a, I keep, I do artist proofs. I keep a reference print, but I don't slavishly need to imitate that print. That is the starting point for the next print. Right. And invariably, it's a bit like music. You know, you don't have to play the same, you know, song exactly the same every time. You know, people vary, vary them over the years. 
Uh, and it's the same with printing that you you can use that as a reference, but things can not it's not even necessarily in, in making an improvement. It's just making a variation. And, and I, I love that. Next image, please. Well, here again, the balance for me is just so extraordinary. I am just seduced into it. Tell us about this one. This is on the banks of Kisharo Lake, uh, the place I return to every year. Uh, so it's quite familiar. Uh, the first time I went there was in, nine, in 2002, I think. And I was not with a guide, so I got into lots of trouble. I wasn't used to working in freezing conditions. You know, I remember driving along the lake and you know, doing 360 in my car in <laughs> snowy conditions, uh, getting my car, you know, towed out by truck drivers because I didn't know when the end of the road stopped and when the snow began. Um, so this is one aspect of the lake. Um, I can wander around this lake for hours and days and weeks at a time. There's always something different. I've been to this location maybe a dozen times, half a dozen times. Um, this is the only time I saw it like this. You know, it's a particular point where it had been snowing in the night, so the snowfall on the banks, um, somehow between the water and the banks, there's a, there's a point where it's a kind of a different shade, this black line, and it, it, it becomes a very musical composition somehow, uh, something that can never, ever be repeated because, as Eugene Age says, nothing is ever the same. Um, and that's one of the wonders of photography is that you can return to the same place over and over indefinitely and create an infinite number of variations and this is just one of them i know in your writings you, you you often say i try to photograph the unseen what do you actually mean by that <laughs> again it's the it, it references back to my time in catholicism studying to be a priest understanding that there is a whole world that we cannot visually the eye is incapable of seeing um, so there are many um, possibilities in, in, in that statement. One of them is that I often do very long exposures. Um, so the film is able to accumulate time and show us a version of, of reality that we as humans cannot see because we can only see fractions of time. Another is that I, I love the, the, the power of suggestion as opposed to the uh, accuracy of description. For me, it's not important to include all details, all the zones. Uh, for me, it's important to be a catalyst for my own imagination, but also I hope for uh, the viewer's imagination. Uh, these are, uh, they've been described as visual haikus, which, which I absolutely love, because the, in a few elements, one is allowed space to create one's own story, one's own reality, one's own fiction. Um, one can recall upon our own experiences uh, to create our own connection with an individual photograph. So what is there is, is not always that relevant. It's what is not there. It is what is described. It is what is beyond the two-dimensional picture frame. Next image, please. I, I'm, I forgot to mention to our audience, if you could kindly, if you have some questions, please send some questions to us and hopefully we'll have a little time to for Michael to answer them. So please yeah. send us. Apparently we can do that, but I'm, I refuse to touch the computer anymore. I, I'm scared to touch the computer right now, Michael, because I think <laughs> we may, I may destroy it and blow it up and lose sound right. again. Right. Um, yes. So I'll leave that to you. You can look at questions. <laughs> Tell us about this image. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I think if I, if I was to create a, a, a school of photography, it would be the Michael Kenner Sticks in Water School. Um, yes. Since day, one, since day one, I've just always loved sticks in water. You know, I just, I, I, the, the juxtaposition of, of human-made geometric shapes juxtaposed, juxtaposed with, in relationship with, in confrontation against 
the the landscape, the more organic, the more fluid elements of the universe has just always tickled me. I don't know why, but it still does. So right at the beginning, I started, you know, with, with photographing those stones that went out into the into water and and uh, deck chairs against juxtaposed against moving skies and so forth. And 50 years later, you know, I find that, you know, I'm still the same Michael Kenner. I'm still visually fascinated by these geometric um, arrangements. So for, for, for me, you know, I don't just go to a place and just, you know, stick the camera and say, let's take a picture. I often take about an hour, you know, wandering around, composing, making these these shapes kind of touch each other or almost touch each other. It's, they're, it's very important, the shapes between things, you know, like an abstract painter almost, they arrange uh, on the canvas. So I've always, I just, I'm fascinated by the way this right-hand pole just touches the horizon. And it's right at the point where that mountain on the right or the, that hillside on the right comes and points to it. And so it took me a long, long time. And I remember I ended up with the tripod all the way. I had to stand on all these rocks in order to be actually be able to see through the, through the frame. The, the exposure is, of course, maybe long, maybe 10, 20 minutes, which I often do. This is one of those photographs that, yes, I can say you can't see this. It's not visible with the, with the naked human eye because it's an accumulation of time. Clouds are passing, water is moving. Yeah, it was between uh, bad weather. So it's perfect for me. I, I love conditions. Um, I don't like the, the the blue sky so much when it's you know and sunshine when there's when there's all these uh, uh, descriptive elements that we can see. Going back to some reality now, I was very fortunate to be with you last year <laughs> at Paris when the official announcement was made of the donation of your archive to the French state. How did that come about and how did that make you feel? And did you feel a little maybe frustrated that, that our, our, our country, England, didn't step up to the plate or <laughs> our adopted country, America, uh, didn't step up to the plate? Mm. It seems, I mean, how did it come about and how do you feel that your life's work is now in a country you were not born in? That's that you know that that aspect of it doesn't bother me in the least. Uh, I do feel like I'm a a universal citizen at this point. You know, a citizen of the world. Put it that way. Um, I found that I started working with this institution back in 2000 when I donated my work on the Nazi concentration camps. I did over a period of 12 years. I donated it to the Ministry of Culture in France. And people I often say, well, 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 why? And my answer is usually, well, they asked me. They wanted it. You know, I was not asked by England. I was not asked by USA. I was not asked by, you know, all the other countries in the world. But France really wanted it. France also has a huge amount of protection, copyright-wise, uh, for people's estates. They take care of the estates. It took a long, long time to figure out this major donation at the end of 50 years of, of my work. but. You know, yes, I just reached the magnificent age of 70. You know, I'm hoping to live for another 70 years. But realistically, realistically, I need to figure out what to do with this mountain of stuff that I have. You know, if you've been photographing for 50 years, you have thousands and thousands of negatives, you know, thousands of prints uh, and just stuff, a mountain of stuff. And, it, and it's not fair to leave it for somebody else to deal with. So the pandemic was the perfect time to, to engage in this sort of introspective and then uh, physical organization of one's estate. Uh-oh, something changed, but is that okay? Can you still no, hear think, me? I can okay. hear you, yes. I mean, I right. think that's what's great about you, and, and you, are, you should be a role model to many photographers, because many photographers have absolutely no clue about reality and and you're a pure great artist but you also have your feet on the ground and yes. understand basic things that you need to be aware of and take care of as a successful artist so yeah. my hat goes off to you for having all these years balanced art and commerce and reality which makes you such a 
extraordinary person to be with and work with. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think we have some questions. You up for some questions? All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What have you got? Okay. Why is Michael's preferred aspect ratio almost, but not quite square? Mm. You're the you're the most unsquare person I know. You're hip. Look at you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I you know I spent the first uh, in in photography school. I experimented with all sorts of different uh, dimensions and compositions. I worked with eight by ten cameras, four by five cameras, panoramic cameras, motor drive cameras. You know, you name it. After three years, I'd kind of had enough of messing around with the technical aspects of photography, and, and I used 35 millimeter cameras then for perhaps 10 years. Uh, I found that was fine, but uh, there's a certain point where you just, you know, you're already making those basic decisions. Is this horizontal or is this vertical? And, and why should the world fit into this arbitrary dimension anyway? And so in the Middle 80s, 1986, 1987, I finally moved over to two and a quarter. Right. Um, first waist level. And I found it was great. It gave me complete flexibility because I could photograph in a square and I could make it horizontal. I could make it vertical. I could make it square. I could make it just slightly off square. You know, I could do whatever. I could even make panoramas out of it. And I've, you know, I've experimented with, with a few different formats since then, but I have found generally that i'm very happy with this two and a quarter um not necessarily square if you actually measured my photographs you'd find that some are horizontal some are vertical some i still crop down to 35 millimeter it depends you know the the, the world doesn't fit into a perfect square all the time <laughs> and so i don't feel the necessity you know we have cartier bresson who insisted that everything fit into his Leica format and that's one way of doing it um, I, I can't do that. It just doesn't work for me. When I'm in the dark room, I find that I'm always moving easel blades around and, and changing things slightly. Okay. I, I, a... I recently had an exhibition of, of, of trees in Chaumont-sur Loire in, uh, in France, the 100 tree photographs. And I didn't realize there was going to be a press day, but I walked in and the press asked me about the show. And I said, Welcome to my family. Because it, I found that I could exhibit photographs that I made in 1973 and prints made in the in the 80s alongside photographs I made in 2022 and prints made in 2022. Um, the formats were all slightly different, but I presented them in a similar way. And so it's almost as if there's this, this great family uh, get together around uh, one big table of all these different prints of different ages. And, and of course, yes, people would say, what's your favorite print? And I thought, that's impossible. I can't tell you my favorite child and all this sort of stuff. But um, so yes, my format seems to be similar, but the, it's not actually. Thank you. There's a question here from one of your fans, Michael, uh, from Mr. Murata. I have come to love and do long exposure photography because of you. I also love it because I can actually experience the landscape instead of frantically trying to photograph it. Do you feel the same? I do very much. I have often people say, well, what do you do in that, you know, one hours or two hour night time exposure? And I say, well, I have the luxury of doing nothing. And that is so fantastic in this day and age where we seem to fill our every second with activities needing to be on our cell phone to respond to the most recent Twitter or whatever it is. Um, I love not doing anything, just being in nature. So I often set cameras out at night um, and I just wander around. I look at stars. I look at clouds. I wonder which way, you know, the, the wind is going. Um, and it's it's fantastic. It's it's the way I think to connect to nature, and 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 in a sense, I'm relieved of that burden of responsibility to be doing something because my camera's doing it for me. My camera's working. It's 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 recording for however long, and whether it's ten minutes or two hours, I don't need to be there. I can just wander off and enjoy 
being in, in, in nature. And I think we all need to do that. You know, whether we're, I often say, you know, I think you can be a photographer, even if you didn't have film in your camera, it doesn't, you don't even need to see the images just because it, it focuses you to be in certain places for a certain periods of time with no particular agenda or, or motivation. You can just be there. And that is a wonderful place to be. I'm going to ask you a question. So what, what's coming up next for you, Michael? Where, where haven't you been that you are lusting to go to? <laughs> well, there are many, many, many countries I have never been to. I would love to visit them all. Uh, I do find uh, that as time has progressed, my motivation is now more towards revisiting old friends than creating new ones. So I am ec ecstatically happy to return to Japan next month. And I will be returning there a, a number of times because I love the place. I'm very, very happy to wander around the coastline of France. I love being in England. You know, I fantastic time in Italy. You know, I go, I'm going to Korea in January. You know, I'll go back. I, I will go all over the place, I, I, I hope. <laughs> but and I'm sure there will be new countries that will come up. But I'm not making a point of saying which countries have I not been to yet. And therefore, should I go to them? Because there is realistically a limited amount of time. You know, I am a busy boy most of the time. Uh, it's not always photographing. You know, I have family, I have friends, uh, I have things to do here. Uh, I have prints to make. Uh, you know, Peter Fetterman's always calling me saying, Michael, where's that print gone? You know, so the time. But, but yeah. let, let me ask you maybe maybe the most important question of the whole hour we've spent together. What's <laughs> what's going on with Everton? Do they have any God. Yeah. Well, tell us tell us about the real <laughs> problems that now, okay. Everton is, 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 has been my team since, you know, I was a child. Since, since I looked around and everybody supported Liverpool, Everton has been my team in England. And now they are second from the bottom of the premiership. Um, I would say not due to all their fault. Things happened in the pandemic. You know, the Ukraine war took away a bunch of their funding. They're creating a new stadium, all this. But they were just deducted 10 points. So there, there is a, this this feeling around Everton circles that this is just unfair. It just can't be, we can't abide this, but there's not a lot we can do except, except okay. what the badge. All right, let's, it's, let's. It's the um, optimum. Nothing but the best is, is good enough. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. thank you for spending your this time. Pleasure. Thank you for giving us uh, the insight into your practice. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to end this session, if we could, with, a, with another aspect of your talent, which very, very few people know about. Could you kindly sing a little Japanese love song for us so we can all go out <laughs> on a high note? So please, I'm delighted to present to mm. our audience. All right. mm -hmm. This is the premier public performance of this, my- This is the first, first and last London concert, is that what you're saying? That's what it is. <laughs> I, I should I should I should preface what yes. you're asking by saying that in my journeys around Hokkaido, I was working with a guide, Tsuyoshi Kato, who would take me to karaoke joints, basically. And I would sing, you know, Beatles and Dylan and whatever else. And people would be respectful, they'd clap, but they were not that interested. And they said, you really need to sing Japanese song. And so uh, Tsuyoshi taught me some Japanese songs. So I will. I will attempt to sing. Let, let's go out on a let's high note. Let's and say brandy glass. Okay. Okay. Go for it, Michael. Kore de yo yoshi o, sone ni tsuyoku nai no ni, yoeba yohu odo, sabishi kuna hate shimau, ana hami da gunde. So to talk a he will kakushita on Nagokoro, itayo do wakaru. You be the two tsunda, Maruiguru suno soko nimo, no kori sukuna hai, ayume kayo retairu. Beautiful, bravo! I'm going oh, to ask, I'm going to ask Taylor Swift whether you can open for her at the next concert. 
Still thank can. you for your time. Thank you for your talent. Thank you for your generosity of spirit. And here's to the next 50 years. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Peter. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Go Thank Everton. You Yay. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs>